Let's all please stand for the reading of the word. We'll be reading 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, let me go ahead and say happy Sabbath to everyone. Happy Sabbath. I hope and pray that every single one of you are truly happy in your hearts. Amen? Yes. Amen. We never want to get used to vain repetition. Yes. When we say happy Sabbath, we want to mean that because there's a lot to be happy about. Yes. And even if it was cloudy outside or snowy, we could still say happy Sabbath. Yes. But how much the more that it's warm outside and sunny, we can doubly say happy Sabbath. And I just want to tell you that I'm very happy. I'm very grateful to God. I, I, I have found joy in service. It's a, it's a privilege to serve. And I really believe that, you know. And so I'm very thankful for the opportunities for us to study together and to learn of him. And so my hope and my prayer is that you'll get something from our study today that will prove to be a blessing to your heart. Last week, we talked about, Lord, teach us to pray. And we learned that we need to pray like never before because we also saw, according to the prophetic pen, that we are living in the very toenails of the image of Daniel 2 as it pertains to the end of time. We saw that there are prophetic agitations that are happening in our world that's letting us know that Jesus is soon to come. And before he comes, the Bible declares there will be a final crisis that God's people will go through. Therefore, we must be fit. And there's no way that we can be fit. Now, I say this as a man who understands the importance of country living, who understands the importance of dress reform, health reform, Sabbath reform, education reform. I am an advocate for all of the above. I believe that true revival always leads to true reform. But I have learned that you can dress properly and still be a devil in your heart. I have learned that you can move to the country and that demons can pack their bags and move with you. I have learned that all of these externals, these are what we call fruits of righteousness. But they are not the root of righteousness. And so if we're really going to prepare for the end times, yes, we need to talk about the reforms. And I promise you, we will. But before we dive deep into all of this external change, what we need to learn is how to pray and talk to God and let him talk back to us. And so that's what we covered last week. Today, what's the title of our message today? Lord, do what? Lord, teach us how to study. Did you know that Jesus left examples in the Bible to show us how to study the Bible? And today, while I'm not going to go into the many methods and mechanics, I can talk about typology, parallelism, I can talk about all of the different forms of Bible study, original language, etc., contextual reading, we can talk about those things, and again, we will. But this message, above all things, I want you to see the attitude of Jesus when he approached the Scripture. The attitude of Jesus when he approached the scripture. And I believe if we can adopt his attitude, all of the mechanical movements of Bible study will be far more effectual. Amen. And so I believe in order for us to get what God wants to give in this message, we need to pray. And so I'm going to go to my knees, and I'd like to invite you to kneel with me if you are able to. If you can't kneel, it's all right. Just bow your heads where you are. But if you can kneel, let's kneel together. Let's pray. And let's ask God to prepare our hearts to receive what heaven wants to give. Our loving Father, Lord, we are ever so grateful. We thank you that you have privileged us the weakest generation on earth, and here is the generation that you want to shine through and light up the earth with your glory. 
And Lord, we just avail ourselves to you. We recognize our weakness. Without Christ, truly we can do nothing. But with Christ, we can do all things, for he will be our source of strength. Lord, we need your strength right now. We pray that you will help distracted minds to remain focused. We pray that you'll help sleepy minds to stay alert. We pray, dear God, that you will help us to truly behold Christ and by beholding him become changed more and still more into his lovely image. And Lord, teach us how to study, we pray. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen. Amen. All right. We know that Jesus was a student of scripture for in the very onset of his ministry, when he started his ministry at the age of 30 years old, or shall I say his public ministry, when he started his public ministry at 30 years old, you'll remember that the very first test that Jesus had to go through was going into the wilderness by which he was tempted. And he was not tempted by a demon, he was tempted by the devil. And when he went through that battle, the only way he came out successful was that he always said what? It is written. Lord, teach us how to study. We're going to look at a little bit about Jesus' study life. And this was a very exciting study for me. I've done, I've done many, many studies. I, you know, I've been wanting to do it this year. My schedule is very challenged. But this year, I wanted to do a one-month gospel medical missionary training. I really wanted to do that because I believe in medical missionary work. I am convinced it's the last work um, by far. It's the last work that God is going to do with his people. Uh, we are reminded of this as we just went through this whole COVID crisis and all that came with it. And uh, while the preaching merely of the gospel was not going forward as strongly, but the gospel of health was doing a very dynamic work. I can't tell you when COVID was going on, we got phone calls all day long and people wanted to know, how can I take care of my body? What is God's promises to us during this time of a pandemic, et cetera? And we were able to minister to people physically and then ultimately lead them to Christ spiritually. I was just in Arkansas the other day and last a week or so ago. And when I was there, we did a gospel of health meeting in Magnolia, Arkansas. And when we were there, all these people came out because they wanted to know, how could I overcome my diabetes? How can I overcome my hypertension? How can I overcome my rheumatoid or osteoarthritis, my cancer, my neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, and the list goes on. They came in wanting to help their physical, but how beautiful it was to see them leave with Christ, his truth, and his commandments. Every single person we did health consultations with turned into a Bible study. I'm telling you the truth is the last word. And so it is that my, my desires, when I do a gospel medical missionary training, part of it, we do deep Bible study, how to study the Bible. And like I told you, we go into parallelism, we go into contextual reading, we go into cross-referencing, we go into all of the different methods of studying scripture. But one day it was as it were, the spirit of God began to touch my heart and say, look a little closer. I want you to look at Jesus' attitude when he approached contextual reading of scripture or typology or any of the rest. And the more that I began to seek, the more I began to find. And I want to share it with you. And so today our focus again is looking at the study life of Christ, the study life of Jesus Christ. Now, there are some scriptures. Now, I gave to several of you some verses that you all have agreed to do some reading for me. God bless you for that. You, you made the preacher's job a little bit easier. I appreciate that, all right? So you know who you are. But I want to go ahead and I want to talk about this. One of the first lessons I learned when I began to study the attitude of Christ in his study life is that it says, and you know, Lord willing, we get this thing together. I'm not sure what it is. This is a, brand, this is a new computer. But nevertheless, we always seem to have this challenge. We'll see how it goes. But I'll, I'll go ahead and read it out because we have some readers. Here's what we found. So the first scripture we're going to have, we're going to look at these texts of scripture, and eventually I know it'll come back on the screen. Our John 5.39, we have a reader for that. And then after John 5.39, Luke 24, 27, and 44, you're up next. And then lastly, Luke 4, 18 through 21. 
What is the lesson we learn about the attitude of Christ when he approached scripture from these three passages? So the first text is John 5 and verse 39. Go ahead and read, sister. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Amen. So notice that. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And then he said, and they, the scriptures, are they which testify of who? Me. Now don't, hold on to that. Now look at Luke 24, 27, and 44. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Very good. Verse 44. Turn my page. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Amen. So notice that again. We're seeing a parallel, right? John 5, 39, search the scriptures. They are they which testify of me. Then he says, read the writings of Moses and the law and all the prophets, for it is testifying of me. Now look at Luke 4, 18 through 21. I, always, I love this story. Luke 4, 18 through 21. Who's our next reader for that? Luke 4, and we're looking at verses 18 to 21. Let's notice what the Bible says here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are, bru that are bruised, to preach the acceptance year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them were, were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Amen. Now, I want you to notice that when Jesus made these statements from John 5, Luke 24, and Luke 4, in every case, we see that he always looked for the practical and prophetic lessons in Scripture that applied or could apply to himself. Whenever he studied Scripture, he was not just looking into it to what was going on in the lives of everybody else. When Jesus studied the Scripture, he wanted to see, how does this apply to me? Where does this fit to me? Where does this match towards me? This is how you can take past truth and turn it into present truth. Whenever you study the Bible, family, you are not just reading stories about what happened to people a long time ago. You're not just reading that. You're reading about yourself. Whenever you study scripture, you have to remember, it is not enough to say, boy, look at how hard-headed those Israelites were. It's, you're supposed to say, after reading those stories, you and I are supposed to look at the text and say, Lord, am I this hard-headed? Lord, am I this stiff-necked? Lord, am I this stubborn? Or, wow, look at how powerful and trustful and faithful these people are. Lord, last week when I went through that challenge, I had the same victory that Daniel had. Thank you, Father. So what's happening is when you're studying the Bible, God wants you to look at it not merely from the standpoint of what was happening to the people in times of old. He wants you and I to look at it as, does this apply or how does this apply to me? Now, not to them. Now, notice how my hands are positioned, right? There's guilt to the left and there's guilt to the right, but there's no guilt to the center. Sometimes we love to listen to sermons that are messages that are for those people to hear. Sometimes we say it in our minds when the preacher's preaching and the preacher hits one of those powerful points, we say things like, Lord, I hope he's listening. Lord, I hope she's listening to that part. And God is saying, no, 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 what I need you to do is I need you to listen. You understand that? As the good old saying says, when one finger points out, there are three fingers that are pointing right back, right? The idea of God is that the more that we study scripture, we should look for where does this apply to me? How could this apply to me? Because that's how I can learn some lessons. Family, this is how the Bible comes to life. 
This is how the scriptures come to life to us. You see, the scriptures apply to us for both warnings and blessings. When you read the Bible, it's not enough for us to look at it as that which was only for them in a certain time period. But there are lessons in it that are for us in either the form of warnings or the form of blessings. Example, you know, when I think of a warning passage of scripture, that applies to us today, that the Bible declares it applies to us today. It is none other than 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11. You'll remember that the Bible, if you, before you go to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11, verses 1 to 10 is a beautiful recount of the experiences of the children of Israel. From verses 1 to 4, it talks about the children of Israel as they left Egypt and were beginning their journey on to Canaan land. And it begins to talk about how they were on their journey and eventually they came in contact with a rock and the rock was following them and the rock produced water and that rock, verse 4 says, was Christ. Then from verses 5 to 10, after God manifests himself, his grace, his power, and his love to his people, Verses 5 to 10 begins to talk about how the children of Israel began to get caught up in complaining. You ever had God reveal himself to you, but you still find yourself complaining about almost anything that you can complain about? It's like literally there's blessings that are right in front of our faces. God, has, God is like, I just gave you a breakthrough. God is like, I just came through for you. I just came through for your family. I just came through for that prayer request that you made. And somehow, because we are so naturally discontented, you know, there's a chapter in the book, Ministry of Healing. You know, what, what did I tell you all is my favorite book outside of the Bible? The book, Ministry of Healing. There's a chapter in the book, Ministry of Healing. It's called Mind Cure. If ever that chapter needs to be read, it is now. Satan is in an all-out attack on people's minds. Do you know that in the very first page of that chapter, Mind Cure, it talks about the five things that produces healing, and it talks about the five things that bring on decay and death. Did you know one of the five things that literally introduces at a very cellular level decay and death in the human body? is constantly being discontented. It literally is. It's one of the five things mentioned, just constantly in a state of discontent. You're never happy. It's like no matter how much God has done for us, we have this magnificent way of ignoring it. And we are stuck just on that one issue that we didn't get what we wanted just yet. Well, here it is. In that state of discontentment, that's what happened with the children of Israel. God just did marvelous things with them. They, they, they're hitting rocks and water's coming out and they're refreshed. I mean, blessings. But what did the Bible say they do? They began to murmur, complain. They got caught up in fornication and all these other things. They fell into deep sins and suffered for it. So what does Paul say in verse 11? He says, now, all these things. How many of these things? All. He says, now, all these things happen unto them for and samples, and they are written for our admonition. Now, let's stop right there. When Paul said our, was he including the brethren the, the, of his day? Yeah. When he said our admonition? Yeah. yeah. So you know what Paul was saying? You know the New Testament wasn't written yet, right? right. So even Paul understood yeah. that the things that we read in the Old Testament can have an apl application to us in our time. Are you following that? Even Paul got that. But I wonder, can we get that? Yes, because look at how the verse finishes. It says, our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Our, the believers, the believers that are living in the time of the end of the world. Right now. Um, that sounds like right now. We are living in the time of the end. We are not at the end of time, but we are living in the time of the end. And so it is that living in the time of the end, Paul says, all those things that happened unto them were types. That's what the word and samples means in the Greek. It means types. Now, every type has an anti-type. A great way to teach children typology is take them outside of that sunlight. And when they get in that sunlight and the sun shines on their body, it's going to put a type on the ground. What do we call it? 
We call it the shadow. And that shadow is a reflection of what? A reality. That's typology. Typology is the language of God speaking in shadows, but talking about realities. And here it is, Paul says, all those things that happened unto them was like a shadow that was going to be repeated and reflected in the believers in the last days. So that means that when you read the Old Testament stories, God says it's not enough to just say, oh, those stiff-necked Israelites. God says, ask yourself the question, am I a stiff-necked Israelite? Search your heart. Now, that's the warning side, but there's also blessings. There's also blessings. Thank God there are blessings. Amen. You know, we just finished doing an evangelism series last year, didn't we? Yep. And when we did that evangelism series last year, I was privileged to be a co-laborer with my dear beloved brothers, Pastor Rod Thompson and Pastor Carlos Munoz. And, you know, I was glad to do my little part in this work, but, you know, it was a whole family event to make this thing successful. All right, from the individuals managing the sound system and getting the tape on the thing so the preacher doesn't trip. I mean, it, everybody played their part, amen? amen? Well, here it is that there's some fruit that came as a result of doing that work. Is that right? Yeah. Now, there's some fruit that's evidently here and there's some fruit that is still in the development process. Amen. But I want you to watch this. In Isaiah 56, verses one through eight, there are blessings that was pronounced in the Old Testament, but watch how it can apply to people even today. Notice, the Bible says in verse one, thus saith the Lord, keep ye justice and do judgment. For, bear with me one second. It says, keep ye justice and do judgment, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the what? The Sabbath. You know, there were some people that did not know about the Sabbath until that fulsome prophetic teaching. Until that series. There were some who didn't even know about it. But then they learned about it. Is that right? I wonder if any are here. <laughs> Amen. Watch. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant, even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. This was not just a promise to the Israelites of that day, but it was also to the stranger and to the eunuchs as well. Continuing, also the sons of the stranger that joined themselves to the Lord, to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for how many? All of for all people. The Lord God which gathers the outcasts of Israel saith, yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. Notice that the promise was given to the people of the Old Testament, but it was going beyond those borders to everyone that would accept it. That's why when you study the Bible, never look at it as what God just said to Isaiah or just said to Jeremiah, but it's also what God is saying to all his people who believe like Isaiah and who believe like Jeremiah. What has God been saying to you all week? Have you been studying your Bibles? Do you see the word of God as the voice of God talking to you, telling you something about you? This is the attitude that Christ would take. You know, the Bible talks about young people. I'm going to talk about this in our Amazing Facts Youth Conference coming up in just a couple of weeks. But, you know, God talks a lot about young people. And he doesn't just talk about young people in the days of Israel, but he talks about young people even today and what they look like in his eyes. Can I show it to you? Go to Psalm 127. In Psalm 127th division, notice what the Bible says. This was not just to the children of Israel or children in those days. This belongs to us today. Jesus trained his mind 
when he studied scripture, where does this apply to me? How is this according to prophecy? Where do I fit in the fulfillment of prophecy? Look at what it says. In Psalm 127th division, if you're there, let me know by saying amen. amen. In Psalm 127, right there in verse 3, right? You remember in verse 3 it says, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Then verse 4, as arrows are in the hands of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Do me a favor. And you'll see, again, I'm going to do this when I get a chance to meet with my young brothers and sisters in a couple of weeks. But just entertain me for a second if you don't mind. Indulge me for a minute. If I had a bow and I pulled out the string and aimed it right at your forehead, honestly, how many of you would be afraid? How many, how many of you would be afraid, intimidated? Yeah? Okay. It's a good amount of you. I don't know, maybe you weren't listening to me. It depends on the circumstance. I said, if I had a bow in my hand and pulled the string back and aimed it at your head, that's exactly what I said. I said, how many of you would be afraid? And several of you either raised your hand or nodded your head. Why are you afraid of a bow? If I let the string go off the bow, all it's going to do is go dung, 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 dung. A bow can't hurt you. But if you look at verse 4, God did not liken the children to bows. What did God liken the children to? Arrows. Now let's rewind that scenario. So now, let's say I took a bow and I had a razor sharp arrow. Now, I want you to imagine me, and I'm working on this, me and my brother Phil right there, we've been hitting the gym hard now and He's kind of beating me up a little bit in the gym. But, you know, I want you to imagine me three times the size I am right now. Pure muscle. <laughs> and now I take an arrow out with my big biceps, my strong arm, and I take an arrow out, and then I put it in the thing and aim it back, and now aim it at your forehead. Now how many of you are afraid? You understand that? Oh, yes, now we're afraid. You get that? God said young people in his mind are like attack weapons in his hand. That's why the devil does everything possible to keep young people out of the church and out of the truth. That's why, because the devil knows if enough young people begin to take hold of the message, Satan says to his demons, we're through. Because young people have a boldness about them. Have you watched our young generation today? They could practice some of the worst and most gross wickedness, but they could do it very boldly. And you know what Jesus says? Jesus says, boy, if I could get their hearts, that boldness, that bold energy that they have for sin, they're going to have it for righteousness. That's why I love my young people that I meet with every week. When I meet those precious young souls, I don't see them as they are. I mean, I know they've got battles and trials that they're going through, but I don't see them as they are. I keep thinking to myself, every Wednesday, you know what I do every Wednesday when I go to your house, Sister Catherine? Every Wednesday, I feel like a tool in God's hands to just sharpen the arrows. Just sharpen them. God's going to get ready to take them in his own hands. And God's going to take them in his own hands and he's going to launch them into different parts of the field where God is going to win many souls for his kingdom and for his honor and for his glory. All I am is I'm a tool there to just say, oh, hold up. You're a little dull right here. Let me sharpen that. In any other area where I identify some dullness, hey, let me, let me sharpen you a little bit here. All right, you look ready to go. Father, take them away. But family, I'm telling you, when you study the Bible, imagine telling young people that you are God's arrows. Imagine just helping them to see themselves in the eyes of God. This is what the Lord says about when you study the Bible. When you study scripture, don't just study it to understand what happened to everybody else over there and over here. When you look at the word of God, how does this apply to me? What is God saying to me? Is there a prophecy? Now, this is where I'm going to go further with our young people. So I hope to see all of you there when we do our uh, conference over there in, at Granite Bay, because you're going to see that I'm going to show the young people where they are in prophecy. And when I show them where they are in prophecy, I have done this message for many years. And whenever I did this message and helped the young people see where they are in prophecy, today, some of those young people today are full-time medical missionaries. Some of them are pastors. 
Some of them are evangelists and they're going all around the world teaching the present truth and getting a people prepared to meet their God. You got to be able to see yourself. Where do I fit in the beautiful story of Bible prophecy? So that's lesson number one. Inspiration says, let us see ourselves in the light of the word of God. Are we in spirit and practice representing Christ Jesus? Are we professing to be Christians but misrepresenting Christ and in our actions testifying that we know not the man? Shall we continue in imperfection in the principles of our daily walk because we do not have the spirit of meekness of his lowliness of heart, but we act as though we were children of darkness and not of the light? Will Christ then say of us, you are my witnesses? We must test ourselves every day. That precious little book, Gospel Workers, page 100, it says daily, it says daily we are to guard justly our hours for study. Not just prayer, but study. And when you study, you're measuring yourself to the light of God's word. Now, lesson number two. He trained his mind. Oh, I love this. Jesus' study life. He trained his mind to submit his deepest feelings to the authority of Scripture. Wow. This was his attitude. Let's go ahead and have our next reader. Matthew 26, 51 to 54. We got to hear this verse. Matthew 26, 51 to 54. Who's our reader for that? All right, my sister. Go ahead. And suddenly... One of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you th think that I cannot now pray to my father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Now I want you to watch this. These guys come to grab Jesus. Peter, who loves Jesus, imperfectly, but he loves him. Peter, who loves Jesus, he sees one of those guys getting ready to grab Jesus, and Peter's like, uh-uh, over my dead body. P Peter pulls out that sword. He aims for the head. He was going for the prize, but he hits his ear. Jesus makes it very clear, put your sword away. And then Jesus says, don't you know if I wanted to, I could call a legion of angels. Now, those legion of angels would deliver him. Is that right? Now, here's the question. When Jesus went through his battle between Gethsemane and ultimately Golgotha, when Jesus went through his battle, did he not want to be delivered? Do you remember in Gethsemane? He said, oh, my father, if it be possible, I don't want to do this. Do you remember Jesus doing that? If it be possible, Lord, I don't want to do this. Jesus did not want to go through with it once the heat came in. Once it got hot, Jesus was like, I don't want to go through with this. And you remember, you know why I put in the quote, deepest feelings? Because you know it had to be deep because the Bible says that blood vessels were popping and blood was mixing with his sweat. So that means that Jesus was not just going through a mild feeling. He was going through very, very intense emotional trauma. And in that intense emotional trauma to not go through with this, he says, oh, Lord, if it's possible. But what did he say to Peter and the rest? He says, but how shall the scripture be fulfilled? He submitted his deepest feelings to the authority of scripture. Lord, is it, is it possible? God says, no, it's not possible. He says, well, then let the scripture be fulfilled. Thy will be done. Did you know that was a lesson for us? How, how are we doing submitting our deepest feelings to the authority of Scripture when we get into our argument with our spouses? How are we doing? I mean, family, did you know the Bible keeps things simple? What's my favorite book outside of the Bible? Did you know in Ministry of Healing, page 363, it says, the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. Listen to that. Think about that. The gospel is a wonderful simplifier to life's problems. 
you know why you all, some, one time somebody came to me, Dwayne, what, what's another nickname you would give Seventh-day Adventists? I said, another nickname? I said, two words. I got two words. How would you give a nickname to Seventh-day Adventist Christians? And I said, you know what a nickname I would give us? Problem solvers. And he looked at me like, I said, no, no. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having, that means it was in the angel's possession, the everlasting gospel. Wait a minute, what is the gospel? A wonderful simplifier of life's problems. If you really have the everlasting gospel, as John the Revelator saw it, you should be masters at solving problems. You should be masters at it. You should be very, very good at it, brothers and sisters. I should be good. But God is too wise to err. He knows that there are many people that's in the right place, but not yet in the right experience. Beloved, there is not a problem that you and I face that the word of God does not have an answer to it. And do you know that God not only gave us the beautiful lens of Scripture, he gave us spiritual bifocals. Somebody's saying, what do you mean by spiritual bifocals? Bifocals, another lens. Is that right? Another lens? You see, if you got a problem in your home, God gave us the Bible and Advent is home. You got a problem with your child, God gave us the Bible and child guidance. You got a problem with your young people, God gave us the Bible and messages to young people. You got a problem in your church, God gave us the Bible and he gave us the nine volumes of testimonies for the church. You got a problem with the minister, God gave us the Bible and testimonies to ministers and gospel workers. You got a problem with your health, God gave us the Bible and counsels on health, counsels on diets and foods. You got a problem with education, God gave us the Bible and fundamentals on Christian education. What problem could we possibly have that heaven has not downloaded the resources on how to solve the problem? Jesus trained his mind. Even when we go through deep, intense, emotional feeling, he submitted those feelings to the authority of Scripture. What would happen to our marriages? If instead of getting wrapped up in how mad I am at him and her, what would happen if we would say, Lord, what would you have me do? And literally open up the word of God and let the word of God become the man of counsel. Do you, under do you understand why a precious little book called Early Writings, page 119, it says, if pride and selfishness were removed, five minutes would settle most difficulties. Early Writings, page 119. If pride and selfishness were removed, five minutes. There are some families that have had issues for years. And God is like, could have been solved in five minutes. But how hard it is to remove that pride and selfishness. Jesus, when he studied scripture, he understood, I am now in possession of an authority that is higher than I. This is how Jesus trained his mind. So whenever he went through anything that he was studying in the word of God, Jesus would look and say, okay, whatever I'm feeling, it is going to be subordinate to whatever this book says. And there's not a problem that you and I face that the word of God cannot solve it. I remember one time I had a disagreement with my beloved bride from my side. <laughs> you know, in another week or so, my wife and I, celebrate 26 years of holy matrimony. And I am actually happily in love. I say that because I know some people are like, yeah, I love him. You know, yeah, I love her. But it's kind of like in passing, right? You know, we tolerate each other. There are three types of marriages. How many types? Three types of marriages. The first kind of marriage is what we call enjoy. The second kind of marriage is what we call endure. The third kind of marriage is called escape. And you know where a lot 
of Christian marriages are? Endure. I'm just enduring him, I'm enduring her. But we are not at the state of enjoy. And as my wife and I were talking last night and everything, man, we were just talking about how much we are enjoying each other. That's what God wants for every single one of us. But there was a time she got on my nerves. <laughs> and I got on hers. And when we got on each other's nerves, we didn't want to talk to each other, you know. So my wife's over there on one side, and she's probably doing the dishes or something. That's one of the ways she lets off her steam. And I was just wearing out the floor, pacing. I pace and I talk to myself. I'll just, you know. <laughs> and I remember that as I'm going through all of this, the Spirit of the Lord arrests my attention. You wrong. I said, no, I'm not. And I began to give God back the word of God. I said, I'm not wrong. I said, because such and such and such and such and such. You even turned over tables. You know, that's what anger can do. It can skew your view of scripture. And God began to redirect my mind. That's one of the, it's, it's, it's a beauty. I, I don't want to use, I use this word very loosely when I say one of the dangers of filling your mind with scripture is God will correct you quickly. Amen. He'll bring back up those verses you studied. And next thing you know, you're convicted. And so I remember being convicted, and I was like, all right. And God is like, go. And I was like, I know what she's going to do. She's going to, like, you know, be all mad and bitter. Dwayne, go. And then I go over to my wife. Hey. And I'm trying to call her, and she's just kind of doing her thing. And I'm just like, hey, listen, um, I wanted to say I'm sorry. My wife is a very smart woman very discerning. Her wisdom can sometimes be a bit scary. And my wife stopped, turned around, and said, sorry about what? <laughs> Do you think she was confused at all about what I did wrong? Nope. She wanted to make sure I got it. And I remember I was just like, I'm sorry about this and this and this and this. And after I gave all of my specificity, then all of a sudden, my lovely wife was like, you know I can't stay mad at you. And I was just like, and I was just like, you forgive me? Of course I forgive you. We hug each other and we make up, right? And what, and, and, and it was amazing because letting go of that anger, letting go of that bitterness was such a far more sweeter experience than holding on to that anger and holding on to that bitterness. And we were at peace. What did I do? I had a deep feeling. I was, at, I was mad. But when the word of God came to my mind and showed me my error, beloved, I had to submit even my deep feelings to the authority of Scripture. And in the end, oh, the sweet, beautiful, peaceable fruit of righteousness that it brought about. This is how Jesus studied the Scripture and it produced much fruit. We're told in Romans 15 and verse 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. You see, in the end, if you submit to the authority of scripture on whatever your issue is, it's going to bring about patience, it's going to bring about more comfort, and it's going to increase your hope. It's going to bless you in the end. So don't look at the word of God as your enemy. Look at the word of God as your friend. When you study the scripture, allow yourself, if necessary, to even be corrected in the midst of deep emotional feeling. Lesson number three. He trained his mind to relate his experiences, good or bad, to scripture. Wow. Wow. Let's go ahead and have our next readers, Mark 14 and verse 49, and then our next reader, John 13 and verse 18. We're almost down. We only have four points. We're almost done. In Mark 14 and verse 49, who's our reader? Who has that? All right, go ahead, brother. Read it. Mark 14, 49. I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Uh-huh. I was daily in the temple with you, and you received me not, but... The scriptures must be fulfilled. The next verse, verse 50, actually says, and they all forsook him. Okay? Now, John 13 and verse 18. John 13 and verse 18. Let's see what this text teaches us. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen. 
but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Amen. I have found that it is a very sobering experience that sometimes we go through nasty stuff. Sometimes things happens to us that we either feel should not have happened, we did not expect it to happen, but one thing we know for sure is it happened. And in those moments, like Jesus, what he did was he was always able to go through an experience, whether it was good or bad, and he would connect it back to something that scripture said, well, the word of God did warn us that people would be like this. Well, Job went through this, and I'm no better than Job. So why should I expect to not go through this? Well, if so-and-so went through this and still came out successful, I don't have to get wrapped up in this experience right now. I can trust God that as he worked it out for others who have gone through it in the past, he will work it out for me. There's something beautiful about connecting your experiences back to stories in the word of God. In the Bible, we have rape. In the Bible, we have molestation. In the Bible, we have many scenes of violence, including domestic. In the Bible, we have so much mental trauma that individuals have gone through. And you know the number one thing we feel when we go through trauma? I remember when I went through depression and anxiety on a very nasty level. You know the people I love to talk to most? People who were going through it too. I don't think I'm alone in that. When we meet people that are going through or have gone through what we're going through, we want to talk to them to say, what did you do? How did you manage, how did you manage through it? What, how did you find success? We love to talk to those people, don't we? God says, well, guess what? Those people are right here. God says, when you go through the nasty experiences of life or when you go through certain good experiences of life and you want to know what to do next, God says, go back to my word because in my word, there are tons and tons of people who had experiences just like yours. Look at how they handled it and go do thou likewise. Don't get wrapped up, beloved. I understand it's our human nature to get wrapped up, but don't get wrapped up. A couple of weeks ago, I did a message and we were dealing with people who have gone through trauma. I know people right now who use their trauma as a license to practice certain sins. They say, you don't understand what I went through, and because of what I went through, this is why I do what I do right now. So unless you know my pain and know what I've gone through, zip it. And they begin to use a justification. Do you know, I did a, I did a presentation. One of these days I may do it here, but I did a presentation showing how Jesus went through physical and mental emotional abuse. Jesus faced rejection. Jesus faced betrayal. I showed how Jesus went through all those things that a lot of us have gone through. And then I show how he came out of it and how he came out of it. And if Jesus did that for us and he wants us to walk as he walked, then guess what? You can do the same. Stop making excuses for your sins. Amen. Amen. Stop making excuses for your sins. Don't make excuses for your sins. That's the devil's way of keeping you trapped. Yep. Yep. I remember talking to a young man, talking about his need to study deeper. He began to tell me about old injuries that he suffered in the past. I said, brother, I said, I've observed you for years. Your injury is not keeping you from studying deeper. It's just you. Yep. It's your habits. Amen. It's not an injury. I've seen what your mind can hold. I've seen, what you, I've seen the capacity of your mind. Don't make excuses, man. Stop shooting yourself down and stop trying to be a prophet. You know what a prophet is. They tell the future. You ever met somebody that says, I'll never be successful? Hey, you're a pro are you a prophet? You can tell your future now? I'm always going to be a loser. Wait a minute. Who said that? What vision did you get that told you that? We have this amazing way of prophesying on ourselves, often negative things. But Jesus says, don't do that. Jesus says, just simply take the experiences you've got, you're, you're going through and connect it back to scripture and look who else went through it and then find out how they got victory and there goes the key of how you can have victory. Amen? Amen. Lastly, I love this one. <laughs> he was multifaceted in his understanding. He did not specialize in one area of scripture. Um, pertaining to marriage, Matthew 19, 1 through 5. We won't do the Matthew 24, it's a lot of verses, but we'll talk about it. But do we have our reader for Matthew 19, 
verses 1 to 5. Go ahead. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read Mm. that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Amen. Now, they came to Jesus evidently inquiring about marriage. And Jesus, did he give a thorough answer? Oh yeah, he gave a thorough answer, didn't he? Now, when you look at Matthew 24, 15 through 31, this is right around the time that Jesus talked about the gospel, being preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. And then he started to talk about prophecy. When you shall therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. And this is what you're going to do next. And Jesus evidently knew very much about prophecy, talking about the last signs and all these other things. When Jesus studied scripture, he did not study to be a specialist in one area. He was multifaceted. He wasn't a country living specialist. He wasn't just a family specialist. He wasn't just a prophecy specialist. Jesus said, you want to talk about family? We could talk about it. You want to talk about prophecy? We can talk about it. You want to talk about end time events? You want to talk about practical godliness in the home? You want to talk about how to be a successful businessman? We can talk about it. Jesus, when he studied scripture, he made sure that he was multifaceted to look at all the areas of life that we face as humans, and he became intelligent. Do you know the book of Proverbs is one of the best books to understand business principles? One of the best books in the Bible is the book of Proverbs. It is filled with business principles. Obviously, Daniel. Daniel was a man of strict integrity. Daniel wouldn't even steal a pencil from the office. There are so many examples in scripture on business principles, financial management, and the rest. How could God say, if any man strives for the mastery, he must be temperate in all things? 1 Corinthians 9, 25, right? If we're going to be temperate in all things, then thank the Lord, the Bible teaches us all things. Don't just be the prophecy guy. But you don't know how to counsel somebody when they're going through a problem in their marriage. I know people like that. They know how to talk prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. But if somebody has a problem in their marriage, they pass them on to somebody else. I didn't see Jesus doing that. And Jesus was 100% human, and he knew what he knew as a human. Remember, Luke 2, 52, the Bible says, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Now watch, Jesus had to grow like anybody else. Are you following that? When he lived on this earth, yes, he was the God man, but when he lived on this earth, he lived as man. And he had to learn. He had to study. Now, Jesus is multifaceted. He can teach prophecy. He can teach subject on the family. He could counsel. He could talk about finances. He could talk about anything. And he learned that in just a little over 30 years. He became multifaceted in all these areas of scripture in under 33 years. Some of us have been in the church for a long time. And some of us have 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 had the privilege of being in the faith. I've been in the movement for 30 years. And what I'm saying to you, beloved, is maybe God wants you to level yourselves off a little bit. Don't just be so bent on one side of Bible study. Learn the other sides too. It'll balance you. It'll balance you. Jesus was very balanced. When he studied scripture, he studied with an intentionality that I want to know the subjects that affect humanity. When you study your Bible, you want to know the subjects that affect humanity and how God can use you. Today we learn four principles of Jesus' study life. In his study life, he always looked for the practical and prophetic lessons in scripture that applied or could apply to himself. He saw himself in the text. We must train our minds to do the same. 
Principle number two, he trained his mind to submit his deepest feelings to the authority of scripture. We are 100% human, and as a result of that, we can also go through things in our lives where sometimes we have deep feelings. Those are the most important moments to go to the word. Lord, give me guidance. Show me what I should do. And whatever the word of God says, no matter how much in your mind you disagree, let the word of God be the word of God. Principle number three, he trained his mind to relate his experiences, good or bad, to scripture. This is what especially kept him emotionally balanced. Before he would get caught up into, you know the Elijah syndrome? We call it the Elijah syndrome. I'm the only one, there's nobody else. Right? God had to remind Elijah, hey, 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 wait, there's 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal. Once we begin to single out ourselves from everybody else, it is the best demonic preparation for excuses for sin. Listen carefully to what I just said. Once we separate our experience from everybody else, as if we're the only one going through this, it is one of the most demonic things that the devil will use to prepare us to make excuses for our sins. Because if you're the only one going through it, then nobody else can understand. And therefore, I have a license to do what I'm doing right now. God cancels that whole frame of thinking by saying, remember, train your mind to relate your experiences, no matter how good, no matter how bad, go ahead and look it back at the experiences of my people. That's why the Bible is filled with so much drama. It removes our ability to make excuses and single ourselves out and say, I'm the only one going through this. God is like, no, 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 there's others who have gone through worse. And they still remain faithful. You can do it too. Lastly, remember when you study, Christ was multifaceted in his understanding. He did not specialize in one area of scripture. Don't specialize in just one area. When you study your Bible, look to understand all of the dynamics of human life, of your human life. Look up, what does the word of God say pertaining to this, pertaining to this, pertaining to this, pertaining to this? I love it. I love it. Seriously, by the grace of God, I've sought to pattern my life by this. And, you know, filled with failures. So please hear me good on that. All right? This is so not the perfect guy standing before you. I'm talking about the perfect guy. Okay? Let's get that straight, please. You know, filled with failures. But I'd be a liar if I were to say, but not also filled with some good success. And the successes I praise him for, for the failures, I learn from them and get, and get better. And what I'm telling you, family, is when you begin to take your finances, you take your health, you take your dress, you take your diet, you take every area of your life and measure it with the word of God and become intelligent on, on these things. We're told in that precious little book, Christ uh, Counsels on Health, page 506. It's a prophetic statement. In Councils on Health, page 506, it says, as religious aggression subverts the liberties of our nation, those who stand for freedom of conscience will be put in unfavorable positions. Now watch this, continuing the quote. It says, for there, the there are the people who stand for freedom of conscience. Real quick check. Is that you? Yes. Amen. It says, for their own sake, while they have opportunity, they should become intelligent in regard to disease, its causes, prevention, and cure. End quote. Did you hear that? Those who stand for freedom of conscience for their own sake while they have opportunity. Uh oh, that means it sounds like maybe they won't always have the opportunity. So what thou do is do quickly. But it says for their own sake while they have opportunity, they should become intelligent in regard to disease, its causes, prevention, and cure. The next sentence says all those who do this will find a field of labor anywhere. The last work is medical missionary work. What I'm trying to say, family, is get balanced. Don't just specialize on one side. Know one side good, but when you know it good enough, switch to another side, and then switch to another side, and then switch to another side. Our scripture reading was studied to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
what we did was we took the importance of Bible study a little deeper today in our study. Did we not? We took it a little deeper. We weren't just merely talking about contextual reading and typology and original language and all these things, even though those are very important, very essential. But today we studied the attitude of Christ when he approached scripture, what he was looking for and what he allowed to be demonstrated in his life. You know, for some of us in this room, maybe this is the first time that we might say, Lord, I, I've never given as much attention to how you studied and approached scripture. But if you've seen something beautiful in the study life of Christ and you're willing to say, Lord, by your grace, I want your study life to be my study life, I want to invite you to stand to your feet with me. If you're saying to yourself, Lord, I want your study life to be my study life, we're going to walk in an intelligent religion. We're not just going to simply just go around and quoting and saying stuff about God out of context, nowhere near Christ said it, and the list goes on. No, 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 no. We are going to study how the master studied. And by his grace, we want his study life to be our own. Today, we talked about, Lord, teach us to study. And I believe Jesus taught us, amen? He taught us today. The next time I have the privilege to come back and do our next study together, that next time that I'll be teaching myself will be on June 3rd. But on that Sabbath, Lord, teach us how to witness. Can't wait. Lord, teach us how to witness. Teach us how to share you with others. There's some special gems that Jesus has put in his word for you and I. So I want you to know that as you stand, Christ stands with you. He loves you with an everlasting love, and he wants you to be successful. And I promise you, beloved, while we will get to our country living, we will get to all of the beautiful reforms. We'll get there. And by the way, reforms are beautiful when they're done right. Amen. We're going to get there. But this is the fundamental foundation. Fundamental foundation. Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to study. Teach us how to witness. This is foundational. And then we'll see where God takes us from there. I thank God for each and every one of you standing. I stand with you. I'm still in class. I have not graduated. But I'm thankful for what I've learned, and I hope that you learned the same. Let's pray together. Our loving Father, Lord, we thank you so much. Thank you for allowing your son to be our excellent example. We don't have to look any further than Jesus. Lord, as you have shown us so clearly, he not only taught us how to pray, but he taught us how to study. I pray that as we begin this journey of studying as Christ did, may we enter into experiences that are transforming for each and every one of our lives. And then help us, Lord, to go share it with others. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen. Amen.